I have come to think that privilege is a deeply important, absolutely foundational concept within public health ethics and public health practice, and also that it's quite uh, poorly understood and that this has major implications for the health of populations, that we need to do a better job with, in public health and across the whole sphere of health in understanding the concept of privilege because it has direct bearing on our actions to try and promote health equity. So specifically, I think about privilege in a particular way. I think about it as the unearned advantage that people receive from systems of inequality. And I have a model of a coin that I use to help me make sense of this. So if the coin is the system of inequality, so the broad historic structure that's in place that we're all socialized into, this is not about individuals, this is about a system, a structure, like racism, like settler colonialism, like ableism, like sexism and patriarchy, like heteronormativity, these big, big structures. Well, you find yourself in relation to that structure, not by choice, but by virtue of who you happen to be. So for instance, if it's racism, people who receive unearned disadvantage from racism are racialized folks, folks who are black and brown. If this uh, coin is settler colonialism, the people who are unfairly disadvantaged by settler colonialism are indigenous folks. Right? And these are the folks that are so expert on how these coins operate, these systems of inequality. That's where the expertise lies, and that's where the historic movements for change have, have been driven, right? There's also a top of the coin. And this is frequently is completely shaded from view, all right? If there's even an, un an understanding that there's a coin, frequently public health is framed as if it's in charge of or seeking to make things better for folks who are on the bottom of the coin. But can we draw attention up to the coin itself? And can we come to conceive that there's a top of the coin? In the same way that people receive unearned disadvantage, there's a corollary position. Folks who receive unearned advantage, not because they choose to, but because of who they happen to be. The same way that racism gives unearned disadvantage to racialized folks, it gives unearned advantage to folks who are white. They might not know it, you may not ask for it, you get it nonetheless. The same way that settler colonialism, that coin, gives unearned disadvantage to folks who are indigenous, it gives unearned advantage to folks who are not indigenous, also known as settlers. In fact, we've heard of white. Many people haven't even heard the term settler. It's so invisible, the top of the coin is so invisibilized that we frequently don't even know it exists. So I think of privilege as this position on the top of the coin. And it matters, it matters deeply that this top of the coin position gets invisibilized, right? It gets, it's, we have lots of names in public health for the folks on the bottom of the coin, right? Disadvantaged communities, marginalized populations, key populations, priority neighborhoods, hard to reach populations, hard to serve, on and on and on. What are the common names in public health for the folks, the populations on the top of the coin whose health outcomes are better because of the unearned advantage they receive? Now, what do we call all those folks in, in practice and in research? We don't call them anything, right? There is no name for that. We don't even have a nomenclature for this top of the coin. So why does that matter? Why does it matter if we only understand these systems in terms of the folks who receive unearned disadvantage and sometimes the system of inequality that gives them unearned disadvantage? Why does that matter for health equity? I'll propose that it matters for at least two really, really important reasons. The first is because what you frame as the problem sets the universe of possible solutions that will follow, all right? What you frame as the problem, if I frame the problem as folks on the bottom of the coin, I will only come up with solutions that address that problem. I will never come up with solutions that actually address the upstream determinant, this system of inequality. And I certainly won't come to conceive of the top of the coin as a problem. It's off the table. So it limits the possible solutions we have to trying to tend to health equity, right? Or inequities between the top and the bottom. But the second reason that it's important, and this, this is so big and yet so unspoken in public health, this has been my experience, is that by invisibilizing the top of coin, it makes it possible for folks in public health 
who find themselves in that position on the top of the coin, right? So white folks who are interested in doing anti-racism work, non-Indigenous folks interested in trying to reduce Indigenous settler inequities, straight folks trying to work against heteronormativity, able-bodied folks trying to dismantle ableism. Any of those folks who are trying to work on these structures or with these people on the bottom of the coin, by invisibilizing the top of the coin, it allows us, I've included most of those groups, to position ourselves as outside of this system of inequality, as over here, as neutral, as unconnected, as opposed to complicit, right? It allows us to frame ourselves as it relates to these systems of inequality as altruistic. I'm engaged in public health and social justice work because that's unfair. When really, we are complicit. It's the same forces that make health worse on the bottom of the coin that make health better on the top of the coin. And without coming to see our actual complicity inside these roles, it allows us to position ourselves as neutral and to accept the social norm that we are the experts that should be helping these helpless folks on the bottom. But who's the expert, right? Who's the expert when it comes to these systems of inequality? It's folks on the bottom of the coin. Folks on the top of the coin barely even know there's a top of the coin. And yet it, gets, it allows us to reproduce that system of who gets framed as the expert and who gets framed as in need of help. So top of the coin is what I call privilege. And I propose that it's deeply important for folks working in public health to come to understand their multiple positions of privilege so that when they find themselves on the top of the coin and want to dismantle a system of inequality, they understand their relationship within it that allows them to do this health uh, equity promoting work far, far more robustly. I understand allyship and its role in public health in a very specific way, and it relates to my understanding of privilege. So if you'll recall, the coin is a system of inequality. People who find themselves on the top of the coin I talk about as being in a position of privilege. I propose that allyship or practicing allyship is the orientation for folks who find themselves on the top of a coin who wish to dismantle the coin. So allyship or practicing allyship is an orientation for white folks who would like to work on racism, for straight folks who would like to work on heteronormativity, for um, settlers who would like to attend to indigenous settler inequities. And this uh, requires quite a dramatic reorientation from the typical way that society views the role of folks up here. So usually it's about saving or fixing the folks on the bottom. The reorientation, once you can understand that the experts are on the bottom, people on the top are complicit and barely even know it, right? It shifts the orientation for practicing allyship from, I wish to save or fix these folks down here, rather to, I seek to understand my own roles in upholding these systems of inequality. I seek to learn from people on the bottom of the coin. And if I'm going to work with folks on the bottom, it's not as the expert that's going to help them. It's working in solidarity with them so that we can all be dismantling the coin. So how to do it, right? What are, what are some first steps? And one of the very first steps is to come to understand the coins for which one finds oneself on top. Right? All of us are on the top of some, on the bottom of others. And that's what some folks would talk about as intersectionality the different ways that our social identities give us a free lift sometimes and give us uh, quite harmful oppressions in other times. So the first step is figuring out, so which coins am I on the top of? All right, so even figuring that out is, is a breakthrough for many folks. And once you do, it's no longer about, so I really, I, I want to, I am white and I am really concerned about racism. It's not that therefore I need to learn about racialized folks. It's that I need to learn about the social structure or the coin of racism and I especially need to learn about whiteness, white, white identity. Or there's so many non-Indigenous folks right now that are deeply concerned with Indigenous health, right? And even that, it gets framed as Indigenous health, only the bottom of the coin. Well, if you're a non-Indigenous person concerned with Indigenous health, a first step in terms of practicing allyship is to learn about settler colonialism and the identity on the top, to learn what does it mean to be a settler? Right? 